Um, so, we're all here because I'm going to talk about my favorite subject. Um, and uh, there might be some friends and family in the room as well. Thank you for that. And they've listened to me at home, but now they will listen to me here. There we go. Um, I, I'm going to talk about the subject area of university entrepreneurship. That's an area which is a bit emerging, which is what I put it in, in my heading. And um, I will be talking about research as well as developments in this area. And of course I will be heavily relating to what we do every day here at Chalmers and especially at the School of Entrepreneurship. If I was to stop right here, which I won't, I would emphasize two things. The people, Anders and Lotta here, represented that become entrepreneurs. 2006, they were part of developing what is still emerging into a really interesting clean tech innovation, a tidal water energy uh, thing underwater called Vinesto. That will be the second thing. So this one and this one, the competency, as well as the innovation that we can actually make happening here at Chalmers, perhaps more than Hello Morgan, perhaps more than many other places would be the argument. Now, since I love to talk about university entrepreneurship, I will talk a little bit more than this, but as a starter. So the agenda is, first of all, putting a bit of Chalmers as well as the area on a map. Just introducing what I see as, as my subject area, okay? Um, but, but also relating it to the fact that we are here at, at Chalmers, because um, I wouldn't have done this anywhere else uh, that I've been doing, and colleagues with me, to be honest, and I'll try to explain that in a in a short way. Now, after that I'll actually talk about some recent uh, research, some publications or ongoing research that hopefully will add to the picture of what we are doing and what we can do and what we want to do. So I'll give a, some insights from a study about uh, incubated venture creation in Sweden um, and the importance of surrogate entrepreneurs. And surrogate entrepreneurs is what it sounds like, so we'll get back to that, but that's kind of what we're doing here when we put our students together with inventors. They are then student surrogate entrepreneurs. So uh, look into that. It's a practice that's become big the last 15 years to actually have surrogates uh, in many of these ventures who are started by academics sometimes, but also by others, but by inventors normally. Then I'll bring in two studies, recent studies, done with two colleagues. Uh, and one is called in, is about integration of scientific and entrepreneurial roles among research managers in nanotech. And I'm happy that we have one, probably two in the room. Jaron is here, and my dad is hopefully soon arriving. He's from that region as well, even though he's retired. Um, hopefully, we'll find him. Um, that's one because I'm really interested in not only the stuff that we've been doing on the student and the innovation side for 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 long now. I'm also as interested in what what the developments in Sweden, but also locally at Chalmers means for the role that you can take and the identity and the activities you can take as, as a researcher or a scientist, I would say. Um, another study is done around what happens today when, when uh, scientists do venture creation as compared to 25 years ago when this thing called venture creation was seen as the least compatible thing to do in academic entrepreneurship. Is that still the case? That question was asked in, in that study. Um, I will then round up a bit with our recent developments in entrepreneurship education, and I will conclude and try to point a little bit at where we're heading. Um, I'm saying we because this is really a research group that we have nowadays called the Entrepreneurship Research Group. Um, so I will be relating to that, but, but of course I primarily talk about the things I've been close to myself. Hello, Dad. Welcome here. Um, just made the intro. Now, from uh, review 2007, the first real review about university entrepreneurship by Rother Mel and co-authors, uh, the definition is the following. Entrepreneurial activities in which a university could be involved, including but not limited to patenting, licensing, creation of new firm, facilitating technology transfer through incubators and science parks, and facilitating regional economic development. So it's quite a mix, but this is pretty okay for me because I 
been more or less relating to most of these things over the years. So that's one way of defining it. I have a personal reason that I like this rather than only entrepreneurship as well, even though I certainly represent, I hope, entrepreneurship, and that is that the word university adds something, because the university, that's the institutional side. So, whereas entrepreneurship is the more transformational, individual, the creation of value, the creation of ventures, etc. And the, the field of entrepreneurship is heavily focusing on the entrepreneurs, okay? And I, I think that's unbalanced. I do see that it depends very much upon in which environment you are and how you're supported and what the institutional structures are, uh, what kind of entrepreneurship you would have. Go to Italy and in the south, it would be, entrepreneurship would be the mafia. In the north, it would be very, very prosperous and very successful thanks to things such as this church and the, the unions, etc., and the transparency that is created in the north of Italy. So I like the fact that there is two sides to this subject. There are the institutional, but of course I love the action as well. That side is very natural for many to, to see, but I would emphasize that. Now, just to give you a hint of how the field looks like, and you probably can't see this from way bit back, but this is once again Rother Mill, and uh, done in 2007, and it's a lot of papers, but you can see if you have two articles here, you're in the list, so it's not very many. And the top guy is Mike Wright from the UK. But already here you start having uh, Swedes. So the Swedes are the blues. Lindelöf and Lefstin done stuff in Gothenburg. One of them is, as you know, a professor here in, in, in our department, uh, Lefstin. So they are way top here with four publications. Magnus from Linköping, Magnus Henriksen from Stockholm, Meryl Jacob, I'm on one of those publications already in 2007. She was here when she wrote much of her stuff. Uh, and then, not to forget about Torkel Balmark, the, the now passed away first professor in innovation engineering, um, who got his professorship in 64, uh, electronics professorship, having been in the US, learned about the microelectronics revolution, and was really the, the grandfather of what now is venture creation at Chalmers. And actually, I also noticed in this study, one of his publications here is this one from 82, um, the first publication in University of Entrepreneurship was 81, so he was pretty, pretty much in the founding of this area, if you like. Then happened nothing, then happened nothing, and the peak started really in the beginning of, of the 2000s. They are not the peak, but the, the, uh, the uh, increase of literature in this area is only less than 10 years uh, ago. And actually what they studied was this. Chalmers University spin-off rate per employee during this period was only slightly lower than at MIT and 10 times higher than Stanford. Wow, that's mind-blowing, isn't it? And I, I'm sure they've done a good job methodologically. And of course, the thing that's important here is this. In comparison, Chalmers spin-offs uh, on average had fewer employees and thus less growth. I would emphasize much less growth than some of the companies started. Hello, Osa, nice to see you. Some of the companies started uh, in the Bay Area region, so, so we, we absolutely uh, have had this in mind. Uh, people like Søren and me, when we were thinking about starting the school, was that we want to focus on the growth aspect. We knew then that we did a lot of spin-offs at Chalmers, but we also knew that many of them did not grow. We wanted them to grow. Um, so, early research in the area. Now, uh, before taking the, the uh, second point here, just to mention, I mean, we have to remember the older parts of, of, of our history as well. He was businessman entrepreneur. The first president was an entrepreneur. This guy got his Nobel Prize 101 years ago and was also an entrepreneur while also being uh, doing research. So, so we've had this very fortunate place called Chalmers, people like me and others, to, to build on when we really understood this, in my case, then after my dissertation in 96 when I choose to, to, to go into this Chalmers School of Entrepreneurship um, starting and development. And because of Balmark and others, and nowadays many others, uh, we're pretty well recognized um, in the world. And I don't have to say this, I've taken away citations. I could have put you also there, I could have put, uh, put Osterbro because he's been away so, so long, so he's not a Chalmers person anymore. Uh, so, 
<laughs> and we're in the OECD report, so, so we have people who, who put us up there, rightfully or not, with, you know, not just MIT and Stanford, but with, uh, in, in Europe, we're there with like Cambridge and others. Um, I would say it's rightful, but I do see that we should continue to show more success and more impact, but, but m many of the things we do are, are absolutely in the cutting edge and we're leading. So I'm really happy, as I said, to be here and being able to do this. Um, that I've done so far. Now, university entrepreneurship has been lacking one thing, and that's been sad because the thing that we always have added has been the educational part. Uh, a colleague from California uh, did a review in 2011 just checking how much intercorrelation there is between tech transfer and entrepreneurship education. For me, this is what we do every day, so for me, this is like the big, big potential that we are utilizing every day at our School of Entrepreneurship. But really, you know, he only found two of 85 articles uh, in entrepreneurship education that mentioned technology transfer, and only six of 242 on technology transfer that mentioned education. So, uh, only five of 515 had published in both entrepreneurship education and technology transfer. So, the the thing that we've done, which is a picture here from 97, to position in the valley of death, which is a very important word in this thing called, you know, university entrepreneurship, to position an education and competence development here, and actually not just ask for education, but we already, when we started the school, we asked for more innovation, more impact. That was actually the reason we started. We said, why don't we find 10, 20, 30 people from a thousand of students per year that might want to be here in the Valley of Death and that can see opportunity if they are given the support and also are connected with some kind of research, invention, etc. They might just bridge this gap. That was our analysis. The main reason there was a gap then, we thought, CERN and I, was that there is a lack of entrepreneurial competence. And I would say, yeah, that's that's that was a pretty good good bet. That was only a bet in those days, but now I would say there's a lot behind it. There are other aspects in this gap, financing aspects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But without those who are willing to see the opportunity of going in here, talking both with the research side, but also trying to push it towards the market, towards the customer, etc. Well, much of the rest, much of the other mechanisms that governments puts in place are not necessarily. Uh, meaningful, I would argue. And today we have, just as two, of course, uh, interesting examples. We can begin with this one, since I mentioned it on my first slide. They were one of 50 best inventions of the year, 2010, and it comes actually from Saab. So Chalmers today has ideas that do not necessarily come from Chalmers. We're happy to take ideas, as long as they're good, from anywhere, and in this case it was uh, invent, inventive works on algorithm, how to actually run this 12 meter spanned wing against the tidal water in the best way so that you get a good effect in the turbine. And by the way, if this makes it, it can account for 10% of all electricity production in the world. And as you can see, it's not bothering anyone. It's not on top of the hockey fjord, it's beneath the hockey fjord, just to use a recent example from a region. I know. Probably shouldn't be fishing there, but okay, you can fish somewhere else. So it's very, very sustainable, and it's actually then financed now five rounds of venture capital, which is primarily coming from oil actors, shakes and others, who are then using their rich richnesses to put it into to clean tech. So this is really transformational. And there's a lot that did not have an engineering background, by the way. They would not have been high-tech entrepreneurs without the school. This was actually twice at the school in 2005. The students said no to the idea. Don't ask me why, but they have the final decision. 2006, they said yes, and now it's about to happen. So both this technology as well as these entrepreneurs would not have been there without there being a school of entrepreneurship. That would be my argument. A little bit more Chalmers oriented is this case, and this is Nandan, he's a PhD from Technical Textiles. And uh, we stumbled upon his idea already back in 96, CERN and I, when we were looking for ideas for the first version, and we said, no, this is not really what we want for this first year. We were probably stupid, but that's what we said. 
He then went to Stockholm and looked for business angels for four or five years, and he got some money, but it wasn't really growing. And he came to us in 2002, and Andreas was one of the persons in the project, and he's still in the company Oxium today. It took seven years from there, so approximately 2008 and 9, it started to become positive cash flow. And uh, also has looked into this, says it normally takes like 15 years until you really see what's a star and not a star. So this is really tough to, to, to uh, do because it takes, it takes time, except perhaps in areas such as IT. And guess where the venture capital goes today? Only to ICT. They want to make quick money. So if we want sustainable innovation, we need to have other ways of securing that these kind of innovation. Here it's obvious this is also sustainable. It's taking high performance material, uh, band woven carbon uh, fiber, and used in Formula One cars, hockey sticks, and all kinds of things, and uh, gives a really nice uh, performance. Before band weaving, these kind of things were uh, not industrial, but now it is industrial thanks to Oxio. Um, so, two examples, and this is just the ending of the first part, so I'm not going to talk too much about our babies, but just so you understand here, it's 16 years, 40, 54 ventures, perhaps more today, uh, and we account for, these companies account for 27% of the revenue generated by incubated technology ventures in Sweden. Okay, that came from the study that I assume we'll go into, and of course it's a bit with a grain, a technoway consultancy firms here, so it's only tech ventures, but I think that's a fair comparison. And, and that makes us the absolute most leading uh, startup environment here uh, in, in Sweden, uh, actually. This floor. We were sitting there a few years, but mostly we've been sitting on this floor. So, fourth floor on the old hospital called Vasa. Uh, so, um, it also says that our student surrogate entrepreneur model not only works, it's actually leading in Sweden. Now, bit of a disclaimer Skype and Spotify did not go through the incubation system, okay? So, a little bit of a disclaimer. So, it says something about being best in this team. But it does not say how, how great the team is, okay? And you understand what I'm saying? But we should be proud about it, and of course it's important that this, this thing that students actually are, are capable of, of winning this together with us and all the support and the system we have here in Gothenburg is, is uh, I think, important. Now, just to conclude the first part, from a research point of view, okay, entrepreneurship education should be a central component to explore and develop, okay? Remember, most of the research in entrepreneurship and university entrepreneurship is not looking at the educational side. Wait a second, we have, we have grown people that would never become tech entrepreneurs into tech entrepreneurs. Education matters. We have to look at that, otherwise we're missing a huge potential. Not we, but the rest of the world. We have it. And from a practice point of view, entrepreneurial learning, student innovation, and student entrepreneurship is finally high up on the agenda. Okay, 2009 we were recognized by the government, 2012 there was a government investigation, Carlson Utredingen it was called, pointing at student innovation, and today almost everyone says, wait a second, if we can have students, and we're not just talking bachelor, master, we're talking PhD student graduates, right? If they can be more the vehicle for innovation and entrepreneurship, we might just get so much more. Why? Well, because I know how my agenda looks like, taking a step here and becoming a lead entrepreneur, would mean that I sacrifice my, my, my work, right? So it's obvious that you need someone else to run it if you are still wanting to stay in the academy as faculty. It's very difficult to do both. Some do it, but there are very few. So the exception is still saying we should have more professors going out there, but the rule is actually that most professors do not want to do this. They need others to do this for them. So why not bring, why not bring in students of all kinds? Um, all right, that was the first part, University Entrepreneurship and Chalmers. I'm heading quickly into some articles. Uh, one is uh, the one that I'm writing myself, The Importance of Surrogate Entrepreneurs for Incubated Swedish Technology Ventures, a working paper version from 2012. It's on Technovation, a minor review, taking ages. Uh, hopefully getting some answers soon. Now, the importance of surrogate entrepreneurs is the title. So, in a study initiated, I did with CISP, Swedish Incubators and Science Science Park, the following very simple hypothesis was tested. Does surrogate entrepreneurship, that is, incubators helping to recruit an entrepreneur, okay, 
incubators helping to recruit an entrepreneur have an impact on technology venture performance, that is, revenue. Okay, the reason I could ask this was that I knew that there's been a few companies started since 95, and some of them should be starting to show some revenue. And I then had to go into public databases and email incubator leaders and sort out which were what. Do you have, uh, is it a surrogate venture or is it a non-surrogate venture? Surrogate venture companies where incubators have helped to recruit an entrepreneur. Um, now, this is the amount of companies that were listed on the websites, and I've been number crunching all these. 49 from Chalmers, so we are in amount of companies leading. Uh, they, in Chalmers, there are 35 that are surrogates, so we have a very high degree of surrogate entrepreneurs, not just because of our school and incubator that's here, but also because our sister incubator, Chalmers Innovation, has also done a lot of surrogate entrepreneurship over the years. Uh, then you can see the, the 26 is just to see how many are academic. So actually, of Chalmers, only 26 are characterized as primarily coming from the academy, meaning that it's approximately only half of our ventures are having an academic origin, meaning that it's actually a lot of other people. It could be like the soft case that I showed, right? But also others coming here to grow ideas, which is fine. Chalmers loves this. We have it in our strategy. But, but that's important to notice that this is not just about academic spin-offs, it's also other kinds of uh, start, uh, startups. Now, you can see quickly that we are talking about lead in the uh, lean shipping, no shipping, Sting in Stockholm, University Uppsala Innovation Center in Uppsala as the bigger ones, and we are the biggest. Chalmers was lumped together because many of the companies started here also went to Chalmers Innovation, so I, I needed for methodological reasons to lump it together. Now, just to see that I love to do some number crunching, thanks to people like Don Andersson here at the Transportation Department, and, and uh, Josef Schaller and Flemming Norgren sitting there, and others, I finally managed to get some numbers. And of course, as many would realize that comparing means, you can't do that because what we have here is like nothing happening and suddenly some are going like that. So it's very far from a a bell curve, right? This is extremely skewed kind of data, okay, to look at this. So how can you actually establish whether or not you have some significance in this hypothesis that I had, that surrogate ventures would be more high performing than low. So I ended up putting high performers in one group and low performers in the other. High performers were those with more than 2 million growth in the last three years of the study, which was 8, 9, and 10 the years 8, 9, and 10, uh, and five, 5 million in revenue at least. Those were labeled high performers and the rest were low performers. And when you do that, you can do the so-called chi-square testing, and actually we got, thank God, some significance on the hypothesis on the 95% level when it comes to all of them, even more a bit on the academic surrogates, which you would have expected, because Academics are even more on the left side of the valley of death, would be the theorizing, right? So they, they would benefit even more from some kind of surrogate. That would be the natural hypothesis. Yes, it seems to be uh, the case. When it came to subgroups, only the biggest group of ICTs were, was supported. Uh, you can see how the average, the median, and the, the means are consistently higher for the for the surrogate group rather than the non-surrogate group. However, that's not something I'm allowed to, to you know, draw statistical conclusions from, but still it's descriptive statistics. Uh, Non-parametric tests show significance here as well. Of course, when we use the t-test, which you're not allowed to, but many do anyhow, I learned, uh, because it assumes the bell curve, you also have some significance. So, so I guess the conclusion was, yeah, surrogate entrepreneur, SHIP has significant positive impact on incubated technology venture performance, which was great because I love HR issues. I love this bringing in the right competence and developing competence. So if it had been no, I would have been sadder. And now we were asked by the reviewer, I was asked by the reviewers to, to bring up the Chalmers case. And of course, there is a co-variation probably with the fact that we very often recruit entrepreneurs by the fact that we have an education, in the fact that we also intervene in other kind of entrepreneurial team formation things. So the paper is saying there's need to look into entrepreneurial team formation, not just surrogates, but board formation, board participation, team building, coaching, action-based education, of course. 
Organized exchanges among ventures, absolutely, it's how to learn between ventures and prolonged nascent phase before incorporation. So having a longer time before you actually incorporate might allow there to be some things. And I will make this argument slightly deeper here because I think we could use some theory here to, to, to reflect on why is the Chalmers model using young 24, 5-year-olds actually working better than the other surrogate model, which would be to bring in senior people that have a lot more experience. So I would use theory from colleagues to argue about that. First, I will use my colleague Karen here, whose PhD said basically this, less experienced surrogate entrepreneurs are less rigidly positioned from the start and more able and willing to learn from the inventors and others while effectuating under uncertainty. So there's some kind of, of learn, learnability aspect here that would be the uh, main, main explanation that uh, Karen would say. She couldn't make it today, unfortunately, but she says hello. Uh, now, I would add some other colleagues here. So, Chalmers avoid the pitfall identified by Clarissa and Murray around senior surrogate entrepreneurs, such as substituting the entrepreneurial spirit by a false idea of professionalism or having unconstructed power struggles between the technology people or the research side and the market people. And we've seen a lot of those over the years. So this, even though it's a pretty anecdotal way of reasoning, I would say has a point. It's difficult to take someone who has to build legitimacy and say, I've done it, I've been on the market, and then suddenly the inventors, the researchers feel like, okay, so what about us now? What are we supposed to do? It takes time to build this team and that everybody can appreciate one another's different backgrounds and competencies. And a lot of times when you bring in too much of a hot shot, it might actually flip over to the wrong side, according to them. And then, of course, in, through a longer nascent phase, uh, including team formation, which is what we have, we, we have a birth process of one, two, three years. Morgan would say four or five sometimes, right? Or Carl as well. Take a long time to give birth to our ventures, right? Uh, but that's good, according to theory, because all these guys here, and uh, girls, I think, uh, are saying that through a long nascent phase, including team formation and action-based education, surrogate entrepreneurs seems to be able to contribute significantly to the genetic structure of the ventures, sometimes otherwise found difficult to accomplish. So basically, these people see that once you've incorporated a firm, or once you have you know, the ownership structure set and the people there, it's very difficult to change the genetical structure. It will be driven in a certain way. Now, if you can prolong that process, have a lot of good dialogues, look and talk and, and relate to one another, then the surrogates, even if they're young students, might just make themselves more uh, meaningful and appreciated, and they, together with a team of everyone, and a bigger role set can do a much better job. So, that will be the way that I would answer the question why this student surrogate entrepreneur model actually is working. You have to understand, for the first 10 years, most people were skeptical about this, right? So it's only now that it's working great, but it took us 10 years. <laughs> so, so, now it's, so now it's easy, but in the first years we have to believe. Um, now is, the proof is a bit in the pudding, you would say. Okay. I will try to make this so you have questions to ask in the end, but I'm pushing myself because I still have a few slides. Second paper is called The Integration of Scientific and Entrepreneurial Roles in Nanotechnology. It's written with a sociologist, Hans Vogelberg, and myself. After many years, we finally got it into science and public policy in this year. Um, and jumping into that is the following. How do researchers, I guess, in leading roles at Chalmers, relate to the integration of academic and entrepreneurial roles in the field of nanotechnology. Okay? Why is nanotech in interesting? Okay? Well, first of all, a lot of people that now are nanotechies weren't that 10 or 15 years ago. They come from different backgrounds and they were more having a, a other kind of identity, like uh, surface science or material science, etc., electronics. Uh, but suddenly, everybody talks nanotechnology. And and uh, so there is, in, in the word nanotechnology, there is something of a mobilizing, there is something uh, happening, something entrepreneurial. And it's interesting to look into whether these people who are in this nanotech community actually, uh, how they look at these pressures coming from governments around nanotech, do more innovation, da-da-da-da-da, right? 
that's, that's, I would say, interesting. Um, now, er, it's also academically interesting because earlier studies were either being critical towards entrepreneurial roles and entrepreneurial activity when it comes to scientists, nanotech researchers. They should not get their hands dirty. They should do research. Don't go commercial, okay? There's a lot of, of, of literature pointing out, no, no, don't go there. Uh, but there's the alternative is that they're unfit for it. You should not do entrepreneurship because you won't become a good entrepreneur either. So there's either critique or they are unfit. Now, our article shows a much more, what should I say, um, deeper picture because all these studies, all without a few, with few exceptions, look upon it from some degree of distance. We really had long interviews with these persons and asking them to talk about what they do and pretty open-minded using an actor network theory based methodology that I don't have time to talk about here. Um, what you see is that they actually are pretty positive. Okay? They are okay with it. Okay? They're okay to take on entrepreneurial roles. Some even starting companies, but most would love to have others helping them with this as well. So I'll get back to what this means in terms of a model in a second. Now, it's pretty, pretty encouraging to see this on the floor level here at Chalmers because policies then, of course, are, are not necessarily recognizing the fact that researchers are okay with blending a more traditional research role with taking some, but not too much, commercial or innovative responsibilities. And of course, we then need to help policy to understand in what way can we help these research managers to do a better job. Much of these things are happening in the lab, not outside in companies. It's actually during the day, so it's a lot of tricky questions to, to deal with. Now, give me, from this paper there is a bit of history as well, which I think is important to, to deal with. Uh, Hans is actually having his, his, he has a history background, techni technical history. He did his licensure in here at Chalmers, and then he became a sociologist. So we looked at especially the microelectronics history that we have a lot of participation around here at Chalmers and material science. And then much of that today would be characterized as nano. Now if you look at, take that away, that's too long a story to talk here, and look at the knowledge uh, transfer shifts. You can see here, before 95, in areas such as nanotech, there was a lot of connection, a lot of uh, collaboration with, with the industry, okay? There were material science consortia driven by people in this room uh, that were heavily connected with Sunweek and others. They were talking about all kinds of things. Innovation just flooded in that conversation. But something happened around the mid-90s called globalization. And because of that, because of firms withdrawing from their national context, because of ownerships shifting in big, big, big firms, suddenly the distance between the research group and the R&D lab at big companies started to become bigger. And it's in this context that we can see that we have this, what we in Sweden would call the incubator model, but in, in the bigger world it's a TTO model as well as sometimes focusing on research groups building almost like a quasi-firm around themselves. Two different discourses, but they, they to some extent connect. So this is a decoupling of, of the industrial context that has allowed this, uh, this thing called incubation or TTO and, and quasi-firm to, to, to gain some ground is our analysis. Now, since a few years ago, we are starting to see a slightly change <coughs> into what we can call the network model. And that's really where our paper is focusing as well, which means that there is a more integration. There's an integration, integration of research and innovation. So as a research manager in Nanotech, what you want really is you want some verification grants. You would love to have money to allow at least one PhD student to do more innovation. The rest probably should be more traditional, but at least someone who can do more innovation. You would like to have some help with some contract and some patenting and stuff like that. But in general, you want to be controlling the environment that you're running so that you can nurture not just good research, but also innovation. This is what we're seeing, and this means a, a model which is more networked, which means basically then that, yes, we want to have integration in the research group, 
And yes, we also need support structures that can then collaborate with this uh, uh, entrepreneurially oriented research group. And everyone interviewed here does basic science as well. So this is not applied science, which I probably should mention. This is nanotech, so it has to be fundamental scientific work alongside with potentially radical innovation. So this is where things are heading. And before we work this, most people either pointed at this. This will be typically at Skovitz. Some have heard of it. We'll talk about this. You have some people talking about the need to specialize in innovation into a TTO. And here you have Finns such as Tua Nine and others saying, no, 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 keep it separate, don't blend, don't get your hands dirty, it will just mess it up anyhow. But we're saying, yes, blend, make it dirty, but make sure you collaborate professionally. Not dirty, but make it, make it collaborative and networked. All right, that was one. So I, I think this is an interesting development, and I think to some extent, because some of the nanotech inventions that we could see in this study are actually now startups, it's the fact that we have an innovation support system, such as our school, that allows the researchers to feel more comfortable and more easy about doing their part of the innovation. So take away all that, then they might feel a much stronger negative pressure to actually be innovative. And then we might have had different kinds of uh, responses in our interviews than we actually got. All right, with Karen, uh, we wrote a piece called Academic Entrepreneurship Revisited. Uh, university scientists and venture creation and uh, just to give you a sense back in 89 which is almost a quarter of a century back now <laughs> uh, Louis and others uh, did a study on academic entrepreneurship they defined it into five categories there are other ways but this is one way one engaging into large-scale science okay externally funded Two, consulting or knowledge transfer resulting in supplemental income Three, gaining industry support for research. Four, generating intellectual property, IP. And then five, new venture creation. Now, they found, but also others, that venture creation was the least compatible. And for many of us in this room, that will be natural, right? That's very commercial, venture creation. That, that's something that's far away from what we do. This is much more the bread and butter thing that we do as academics. So well, this is really awkward. That will be a view that many of us would have, and we thought it would be interesting to actually <coughs> revisit that. So we explore the changing role of university scientists towards venture creation, and understand the influence of university-driven initiatives for venture creation. So we position this paper in two sites, Gothenburg, including the University of Gothenburg, and especially a case around uh, a vaccine from GU, where Actually, the advisor is sitting right here. That's you. Nicholas, raise your hand. He's the one giving the first advice here in the beginning before it came in here to incubator. Probably enabled by you, Morgan. Hands up. Okay. And these are just some of the things happening in this process uh, here in Gothenburg. We also have a case from Colorado State in Fort Collins in uh, Colorado, of course, which gives the same kind of evidence around... Uh, energy lab, uh, where they also play a similar role, but I won't give it here. So this is stuff that is done towards the inventor. He is now part of a venture which does a vaccine development, but he has not become the CEO. He's not been the lead actor in this after this day here when we started to add our competence, our students, etc. Here, of course, he had all to say, he still has a lot to say, but he is not forced to go into venture creation in the way most of us think of it, which is taking on the lead role. So, uh, we actually then, through these two environments, can demonstrate that it can be more compatible doing venture creation, okay? With a university scientist, uh, being, especially when he or she works not alone, but in some kind of more collective research group or center, there you can help one another and you can take on different roles, being an advisor uh, and stuff like that, okay? And they are important, okay? They are, university scientists are not disappearing out of the equation and let go home and do research and we will do the company. In most cases, it's very important that they are on board but they don't need to be the captain on board, if I may use that expression. 
Um, and of course, once again, the point that I tend to always make, <laughs> I need to, is that involving students uh, is something that is one way that was not identified in back in the 89 study, and a lot of academic entrepreneurship studies are not recognizing that most of these university scientists are actually teachers as well. They can drag in and engage their students into venture creation. Some of us even run a school of entrepreneurship. So why, why not recognize this once again? And of course the role of, of the faculty person is then very important, but you don't necessarily have to go all the way over the valley of death. All right, that was study number two. I'm going into some more recent work and bringing us to the educational level. Um, and this paper was about transformative and transactional mechanisms in entrepreneurship education. And for simplicity reasons, I prefer to call the transformative ones bottom-up mechanisms and the transactional ones top-down. Gives you an intuitive sense of what we're talking about. I won't be able to go deep on this one either, but let's ask, how should entrepreneurial learning, including venture creation, be structured at the university? Okay, assuming that we want more entrepreneurial learning, more entrepreneurial behavior, even nanotech researchers now want to be more entrepreneurial. So everyone wants it. So how should we structure it? Much today is actually extracurricular. It's not in their curriculum. How? Well, in incubators, in accelerators, in camps, in competitions. Almost all this is extracurricular, okay? It's something I'm happy that we have, and many universities really talk about it, but it's not integrated into the curriculum. So, should it remain this way? Or should more progressive bottom-up activities replace what is today traditional top-down programmatic pedagogy? That would be more of a revolution, right? Throw out all the, the courses and bring in all this bottom-up stuff. Okay, what's my take of this and Karen's as well? Well, no, there's a third way. Don't throw it out, but don't remain it, do it the way you always have done it. Okay, there's a third and argu arguably better way. And this paper then presented at a conference is hypothetical. So I will give you the hypotheses. And of course, we want to study this more, more uh, thoroughly. So I call this the zero hypothesis. And you understand when I read why. Without any transformational bottom-up mechanisms in place, only traditional examination of what is in the literature and what is in the given case will be asked for and thus transacted upon in like exams and stuff like that. So this is a syrup hypothesis. You don't have anything that you let the students do bottom up in some kind of uncertainty, creative way. Well, forget about it. That would be the first, the first uh, hypothesis. Now, unfortunately, there is not very much space. That's my view. I haven't done it this scientifically, but there's not a lot of space in most curriculums now to have this bottom up thing. Okay, even though there's a wide consensus that we need it, so we have work to do. It's called strategy implementation rather than strategy because we agree on the strategy, but we're not doing it. Now, much curricula remain thus top-down, cognitive and mostly about, you know, to understand and be able to express things in your thoughts, but not so much affecting skills and attitudes. And skills and attitudes and identity and stuff like that are really, really important in entrepreneurial competence development. If we take that away and we only ask people to, to say how to do entrepreneurship without wanting to do it, or knowing, or, or have, knowing is not there, but having the, the, the preparedness to do it, or, or just daring to do it. All these things are very important to also have in, in the, in, through the bottom-up pedagogy. Now, so a large learning creation potential remains, I would argue, uh, unutilized. Zero hypothesis. So we need to get these things into the curriculum. Not much, perhaps, but at least a little bit more. Now, one, keeping transformative bottom-up mechanisms extracurricular is a missed opportunity to anchor transformative experiences with theory. Thus, such, such experience might be less easy to translate into other contexts. So, this one I would have to just argue about, but basically I'm saying that what we've always done to ask the student to make sense of his or her whatever experience and translate back into a vocabulary using references and theories is actually a good thing, not just for me as an examiner, because my life becomes easier when I can understand what the student is talking about, but it's actually a way to help the person who's been into a contextual situation to decontextualize, to relate its 
his or her experience to a bigger picture and not just know how to do a patent in a specific biofield, but perhaps how to do innovation in other fields as well. So that mechanism is good. That's a good top-down mechanism, assuming that we're asking people to translate, though, from their experience into a language that we can understand. As scholars, there's work for us. Great. When transformative bottom-up and transactional top-down mechanisms interplay, they can be mutually reinforcing rather than mutually exclusive. Okay, so now I'm into efficiency here, that in fact having both, and not just allowing the courses to have the top-down and the traditional transactional stuff, and the, the uh, uh, extracurricular people doing all the, the saunas and the whatever they do, but when you bring them together, it's actually reinforcing one another. Well, I'll just, this is obvious for people here at the eye department, but let me just, you know, give it to you. So, of course, thesis, thesis work um, can and should, when possible, solve concrete technical market innovation oriented challenges that students pursue. At many business schools, you have to be more generalizing, talking about general phenomena. But at least here at Chalmers, you're allowed to do your stuff on something concrete. Of course, you use theories as instrumental to helping you solve the technical or whatever problem, but at least you can do that here, which is, has been key for us, because having my students to talk about general phenomena when they actually need to do the actual innovation would be a disaster. So this is easy, but you can also do it in exams and, exi and, and, in, and assignments. So here, for instance, assuming that they're doing something which is top bottom up, such as looking at the old Samba case, which they just finalized the first version of with Bo here, uh, now a company which is actually, um, what's it called, bankrupt. Still got some cool patents. Um, uh, and they try to be creative around a few intellectual assets. Uh, once I add in my course the theories and the methods, I can ask about both. How did you apply the method into your specific uh, bottom-up case? And they need to be pretty reflective on that in order to get the full grade. That's measuring transformative bottom-up things while asking also about you know how it's integrated. It's this is not rocket science, but it, it needs to be done much more. Assignments, of course, can also be very much bottom-up, but still, if you have very clear criteria, they want that, especially the first half year, how will this be judged? We're acting under uncertainty. What are the criteria that you will use when you measure us and you stick to them and you then are fair? Then they're happy to do this bottom-up thing that they are not necessarily used to doing uh, before in their higher education. So. I think this at least adds to the hypothesis, too, that it's mutually reinforcing. Now, the last one, and this will probably be, oh, I have a few more points, but the, in this paper at least. Students coming from more traditional transactional top-down environments uh, need to be acquainted to the combination of bottom-up and top-down mechanisms in sequential steps. Otherwise, the two worlds might not connect. Okay? If you're too quick in throwing someone into the pond and say, go, go bottom up, start swimming, or otherwise you won't go down, uh, then, then there might be too much of a divide, okay? This is more an intuitive sense, but today, more than in the early days of the School of Entrepreneurship, we're making sure that they have like at least a three-step model. Here they do the real venture creation during year two. They actually then, before that, have done a real-life idea evaluation, where we also wrote a book. Saki, where are you? There you are, and, 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 and with our students and, uh, and co-workers to, uh, and Bo, 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 where are you? There you are, there you are, yes. Uh, we, so we were working a lot about this step, being in between a more simulated step, which would typically be working with a bankrupt firm, like the first step I talked about, in order to be creative. Then you go into real life things where you have real life people with real life babies called ideas or innovations, so you need to relate to them and give advice and package that in a good way and do good, ana good analysis. Uh, and then finally, you can put them in the driver's seat, as we say uh, here, uh, when they actually do real life venture creation, uh, the tracks that are venture creation oriented, that is. So, and then you can launch and uh, it goes on. So that's one way of reasoning. Um, taking from Martin, who's not here, uh, uh, Karen's and my lovely PhD students, who's also a very successful entrepreneur, um, he 
uh, building also on a paper that we did earlier this year, is working on a way to, to categorize, to create a taxonomy around this as well, which adds to this hypothesis. So uh, he would say that creation, all kind of creation would be related to what I mean as entrepreneurial education, and he would argue that as well. Then the moment you focus on value creation, what is that then? Well, that means that someone externally appreciates what you do, okay? Not just, I've been creative, I've done a, a very low emission car together with others, and we love it, but nobody's buying it. That's fine, that's down here. But here it's actually that, whoa, this is really interesting. I very much appreciate this. So this typically then, if you like a customer or a user, but it can be others as well, it can be governments, whatever. People that somehow appreciate the value you create. That would be entrepreneurial. Now, the most extreme version of, of entrepreneurial activity, which we actually do as our last step, is the venture creation, okay? Uh, which is what many think of being perhaps the natural step to go, but our argument is no, uh, it's not. So a more wide definition of entrepreneurship would absolutely include all kinds of learning by creating value for others. Whereas here you have more the learning by becoming an entrepreneur kind of approach. And my argument would be only a few people during their studies here at Chalmers would like to be in that box. Welcome to us. But almost all would like to experience this because relating to value creation, having feedback from others, and, and getting that extra learning that you get when someone else appreciates what you do, would be uh, very good for a future engineer. Um, I'm not sure everybody gets it today. I'm, I know they can get more of it when we want to do that. I would also include and say that this more wide thing, which is typically engineering, could be labeled entrepreneurship as a method. So it's this broader view. So this is absolutely good training. It relates our field to a bigger field of creativity and design, etc. So, So uh, allow me just to put it out there as well. Mm. Now, I've got some room for questions, but two slides about my conclusions and future as well. And by the way, when I'm done, we're offering some alcohol-free champagne on the other side. Please join me. Um, university entrepreneurship <coughs> can and should include, I know you can't call it champagne, right? That's what's your point, but I did. Uh, anyhow. University entrepreneurship can and should include clinical practice and clinical research. So I, I, I really hope that when you leave this room that you feel that you're you know, part of not just studying what others do, but this field is as much about doing things while also then studying it yourself or having others study, colleagues studying what you do and then you study what colleagues do. It's a very practical field. Uh, I'm really happy that I dared, I guess, to, to, to do that. But I'm even more happy that I'm now finally having time doing research and, and talking to my colleagues about it. So it's, it's fantastic. So I love this field, and um, it's a very practical oriented field, but also very important that we do good research around. I hope that I've given you some indications of what we do here at our group. The Chalmers Lab has and will offer opportunities for leading clinical research and development. Well, as long as we don't get marginalized and Gothenburg goes downwards and Chalmers too. As long as we stay relatively vigorous, then hopefully we will, I hope we will, uh, then this is a very interesting place to be. And uh, you know, looking at the student surrogate entrepreneur approach and the venture creation approach, it's, we're just tapping on it. There's so much more to do to substantiate the approaches that we're already into. Uh, I don't want to forget about that. Now, I also see that we need to see what happens among our fellow researchers, people doing hard work in areas such as nanotech, but much in many other areas as well. Okay, what, what, what? How can they get more, you know, tools in their hands and resources to be doing even more innovation? That's a, a still a valid question. I want us to study that, and that's something that we have then also studied. Now. The third conclusion is that you also need to go deep into the entrepreneurship education side of things. And happily, colleagues of mine, uh, I mentioned Karen, I mentioned Martin and Thomas sitting here, and, and uh, Christina and, and others here are, are very much having this as a key, key focus as well. 
So, future, okay, well, improve, substantiate, translate, diffuse the approach, okay, we need to do that, we have a responsibility. We want to do this much more in international collaboration. Two, develop and implement and measure bottom-up entrepreneurial activities throughout the educational system. We want to do this at Chalmers. We already have one course now that we're just about to conclude. We have a contract with Drivhuset, who operates on the Swedish level, doing a lot of stuff. We want to be there and measure that and, 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 and learn from these more broad-based approaches as well. And, which was kind of uh, marketed, uh, I saw on the internet, which is the only thing I will say about it because I haven't done very much. I think we need to also work on the actual innovation analysis side. And that has not been my strength. I've done a bit. I mean, we've, we've, we've done that when we wrote about the, the uh, uh, scenario planning paper. It's about taking responsibility, looking into the future, and understanding how different scenarios might be, be realized or not realized. And I think we have a lot to say, adding the societal aspect and other aspects into very early stage innovation processes together with the nanotech or the biotech or the other researchers. And of course, being doing that, we should do that with a constructive critical view because as, as I said in the beginning, the institutional side is very important for me to, to emphasize. Uh, if we are to build society on innovation, which is what every government today says, well, I'm sorry, governments will not be fast enough to see whether an innovation is going south or going north. We need to add the societal analysis when it's actually happening, and hopefully by doing that, we can then make the innovations more sustainable. So we want to work in the early stages. Um, Sanne, where are you? Uh, you have done that at Safer, together with my sister, among others. I was in a little corner there, affecting the innovation agenda. For, for how what was previously mostly about car safety, to be honest, and now it's about all kinds of, of uh, transportation safety, I guess you would say in English. Would you agree? And also the pe pe yes. pedestrians riding even a bike like I do, and stuff like that. So, so, so that's actually happening, and, and Carl Palmos, who is Papa Lili, is doing similar things around sport innovation. So this is happening, and I, I think that's important, not just for me and the division I am in, but for, for the whole, whole department here and beyond. So that will be my concluding remark about what I want to do in the future. And thank you all for coming. And I think I've done my formal things now. Yes. Bye-bye. So it's time for questions, yes. but first we may.